Good morning. Big day today. Final round with all the 10 quartets, the romantic round. Three concerts, and then of course tonight we have the announcement of the three finalists. Just a couple of things to mention before we start today. Uh, one is that uh, we will have intermission interviews in all of the concerts, 10, 10, 10.30, 2, and at 7.30, because there are three quartets that we haven't yet interviewed. Um, the, uh, okay, I'm Gémeaux, the Linden, and uh, Dover. Yeah, Dover will be at, uh, in the 10.30 intermission. So we'll, I'll be interviewing those three. I also want to mention tonight, after the concert is done, and we're all going to wait for the jury's announcement about who the three finalists are, the announcement is not going to be made in the theater itself. It's not going to be made in the theater. It's going to be made in the West Lobby where we do our intermission interviews, okay? Just so you know. We've got to clear out of the theater eventually, you know, orderly and so on. Um, and then the announcement, whenever it comes, will be made in the West Lobby, okay? All right. So, welcome. Welcome to... Uh, why is there a murmur amongst the... <laughs> why is there a murmur? How are we going to fit everybody? That is a good question. But if you decide... Uh, Lisa Ramsey has said that if you decide to go to bed and you don't want to wait, the, the names of the three finalists will be posted all over campus. So you can go to bed and you can wake up and know. Not that anybody wants to do that, but anyway. <clears throat> but I will leave it to God to decide how all of you will get, <laughs> get into the West Lobby. Uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure to um, welcome our next uh, lecturer. These uh, morning lectures are just a wonderful feature of BISC. And uh, our lecturer this morning is uh, a luthier, a man who makes violins and also has been repairing them, maintains his, the violins that he makes, Samuel Sigmantovich from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Sam is a, a, a renowned luthier and has a lot to say on the subject of, uh, of, of making these instruments. Now all of you know that it is assumed that if you're a string player, you're a young string player, you know, your goal is to own a Stradivarius or a Guarnerius del Jesu or something along that line if you possibly can find the millions to buy it if it's available or to find a rich patron to lend you one for hopefully a lifetime. But of course it's increasingly difficult for young performers to have access to these great instruments. I mean that's certainly been a feature of my lifetime is the mythology surrounding these instruments, the, the great instruments that are being played, and we have nicknames for them, and many of you know, you know, who, which Stradivarius is attached to whom. Uh, we heard the other day about the Tokyo String Quartet and their matched set of Paganini Strads, which they had to give back because they didn't own them. They're owned by the Nippon Foundation, so they had them for something like 18 years. So, but another trend in my lifetime has been increasingly very fine instruments are being made right as we speak. And some of the greatest performers in the world have bought these instruments. And maybe they don't always use them in concert, they may be second or third instruments, but they have certainly uh, acquired them and, uh, and used them and speak very highly of them. I think a kind of watershed moment came in 2002 when the great German violinist Christian Tetzlaff got rid of his Stradivarius and bought a Greiner violin. Stefan Peter Greiner, German violin maker, and he bought it for $40,000. And he claims it's the best instrument he's ever played on. And that was a shocking moment for many. And uh, <clears throat> I believe he continues to play it uh, with, uh, with great enthusiasm. So the question before us today is, do you need a Stradivarius to win? And uh, I suspect the answer may be no. <laughs> but I'll be interested to see how Sam Zygmuntovich gets to that no. So ladies and gentlemen from Brooklyn, would you welcome Sam Zygmuntov. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really a thrill to be here. And uh, it's amazing to be in this environment, which is not only so physically spectacular, but to be in a community of people who, who value music so much. So I, I really thank the organizers of uh, of BISC for bringing me here. And uh, I'm a violin maker. I work in Brooklyn, New York. 
I studied at the Salt Lake City School, and I worked with Rene Morel, who was one of our premier adjusters and restorers. So uh, I guess that comes to our theme. Do you need a Stradivarius to win? And it's, it's kind of a flip question, and as a, a modern maker, you would guess that the obvious answer that I would like to say is no. Uh, but it's a more complex uh, subject than just that, and I'm going to try to explore uh, a little bit, you know, what is Stradivari? What does it mean to win? Um, and uh, so th that's something which is, it's definitely a presence in the life of young musicians now, a great pressure to, uh, to find an instrument that they can, you know, that they can't, they're not like a singer. They can't just uh, open their mouth and sounds come out. They're dependent on this box of wood. And uh, so uh, it's an odd feeling to know that your expression is limited and, uh, I don't know if it's limited is the right word, but what your, your, your equipment will determine what comes out finally in a way. So it becomes a very fraught situation and most people are drawn to classical music because of its traditions. And uh, Stradivari is a, a, a big part of the mythology, just like Beethoven is a part of the, the great mythology of classical music, Brahms, Bach. So, and indeed, they are spectacular instruments sometimes when they're in great condition. And, uh, and they're such a powerful brand name. So uh, I think one would proceed with caution before trying to demystify them too much. Because it's, uh, you know, anyone who's got a use of a Strad, usually you see it at the bottom of their bio and says, plays on the, the something Strad, uh, lent by the so-and-so foundation. Um, so, uh, and it, it's, a, it's a name of, of great power. People, almost anyone in, in the Western world knows what Stradivari is. Um, I'm, when I meet people at parties and I say, I'm a violin maker, they say, oh, what about Stradivari? I read that the secret is uh, uh, the wood was grown slowly or fast or it's high density. Um, I googled the secret of Stradivari and I got uh, 2,800,000 uh, hits. <laughs> if you just google Stradivari and leave off the secrets, you get 8 million hits. So, uh, so clearly it's, it's a name to conjure with. And, uh, and, uh, they, you know, Stradivari and the other Cremonese makers of that time, Amati, Guarneri, Bergonzi, and then some of the other lesser Italians, Guadagnini, they really are fabulous instruments. And the tradition matured of making at that time. And um, it's not just an accident that they are considered good. I mean, there's been an evolution in string instrument making, and there are also very different national schools. The style, the taste and sound in the North countries or in Germany or in France was quite different than the taste in France at that time, and the making traditions were different. Therefore, when you, you know, if you went back 100 years, if you said you had a French instrument, you were saying something about the character of the instrument. And if you said, I had a Cremonese instrument, you are also saying something serious about the nature of the instrument. So it's always a question as a maker, uh, what are the physical characteristics that, that create that sound and uh, to compare styles of making. Because uh, the thing about strads and Gorneri's and every violin is that they're physical objects made by people. And they, um, we, we have to believe that they occupy the same universe that we do and they obey the same laws of physics that, they, that, that we live under. And if they can do it, we can do it. And I think a musician has to feel like that. They can't feel that Heifetz uh, determined the violin playing for all time. Um, and same thing with the composer. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the composed piece. I brought my boys there and they really enjoyed that it, didn't, that it sounded new. Um, but if a composer has to feel that anything they do is in the shadow of uh, a Beethoven, well, that's, it's, a, it's a bit of a burden to, to work under. So one of the, the, under, the themes under here is, first of all, what is a Strad? Is a Strad that great? And there's sort of an underlying question, was it, even if it is great, is it good for us to want it? And I think in the lives of musicians, it, it is a, uh, a pressure that distorts many of their, their careers, and we'll just explore that. So uh, this is some people's view of the violin. <laughs> uh, you know, an artifact from the golden age with a secret that will never be reproduced, that comes down to us intact, unchanged by the ages, no matter what happens. A strad still is a strad, it retains its stradness. That's, the, that's, the, that's what people believe. And uh, when, for a musician, when they are lucky enough to be lent a strad, because God knows they will not be able to buy it, um, it's a little bit like an arranged marriage. So your, your, your wife is going to be Sophia Loren, and like, you better enjoy it, whether or not it's your type or not. Um, so, 
part of what we'll do today is also, I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how violins get made, because it's not that different what we do now from what was done then. And instead of being something that was handed down from the heavens, it's something that starts with chunks of wood. And uh, this is a little close-up of my wood pile. And uh, there's blocks of maple. The maple comes from the Balkans, mostly. Uh, Bosnia is the best source, which is a little, during times of war, makes the, the supplies a little chancy. The best spruce comes from the Dolomite region, northern Italy. And then that's just a little glimpse of me not wearing a tie, uh, which is more usual. This is in my workshop in Brooklyn, New York. And, you know, it's my job and my colleagues' job to take chunks of wood and tools and turn them into instruments. So um, what we have here, this is actually a quartet that I built a few years back. And uh, this was uh, a commission. And uh, some of the people who were involved in it were Brooklyn Rider. I don't know if any of you know them. And uh, I think that they're a remarkable group for a lot of ways. They're fabulous musicians. They have the highest level of training. But they've also really created kind of an alternate venue for themselves. They're, um, uh, they've really learned to work outside of, of um, you know, standard booking agents. And uh, as a string quartet, they've been able to commission their own works, play in alternate venues. I think it's a great model for what needs to happen going forward. And uh, Yo-Yo Ma was also involved in this. Brooklyn Rider collaborates with uh, Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble. So we call this group the Silk Road Quartet. Uh, this is the same group of, uh, of instruments on the, on the hoof, so to speak, um, almost ready to assemble. And this is the, the finished quartet. Um, and it was, you know, once these instruments are finished and they get into the hands of musicians, is when it really gets interesting. And you know, there's definitely an ongoing process of working with musicians where they come back to you and you can say, yeah, it's great, uh, but could you make the G uh, a little clearer, a little wolf on the C sharp? You know, could, I could use a little more brilliance on the top of the E string. It doesn't speak as well as I'd like. Can you make it warmer? Um, uh, there's a list of little things. And uh, that interactive process is quite interesting and, and really is what puts these instruments together in the end. And as part of that process of uh, getting new instruments into the hands of musicians, the Banff Center as well, I think, has been amassing a collection. And a few years ago, to celebrate their 75th anniversary, they commissioned a violin for me, which we have here, and they've been lending out. And I think that's become a very important thing, is uh, institutions have become more and more important in, in getting instruments into the hands of musicians, because so few of them can afford their instruments. Um, when I was walking around, I was talking to one of the quartets, and they had two of the members had contemporary instruments. The other two members, one had a panormo and one had a guadagnini. And I didn't even have to say, when did you get your guadagnini? I said, oh, who lent it to you? It was obvious to me. There was no chance that, that they were, would have bought it. So, do you need a Stradivarius to win? So, first of all, what does it mean to win? Um, usually what we mean is, in order to have a major career, do you need a piece of equipment with that uh, cachet? And also, is that the type of, do you need an uh, object of that value in order to really express yourself fully? Will the sound and the response produced by these rare, expensive instruments really make a, give you an edge? And uh, it's something that is, I think, uh, you know, like say, it's the dream. Uh, a young musician, they train from the time they're small. And they look up to, you know, the stars that they, they, they knew. They're, you know, depending on what age they are, but, you know, uh, Anne Sophie Mutter, Joshua Bell, or Isaac Stern, you know, you grow up with these, with the, just looking at that, that's what you'd like, like. You'd like to be playing in the highest, you know, highest settings at the highest level, holding a Strad, holding a Gornary on a huge stage, that's the dream. Um, and of course, that dream doesn't happen for everybody in exactly that way. And one of the things about Strads and Gornaries and Guadagninis is that they really cost a lot of money. It's just the, one of the basic facts that people know about them. And people say, isn't it a shame that, that these instruments cost so much that musicians can't have them? And on the one hand, yes, but um, on the other hand, that house right up on the hill there with the really great view, it's a shame that I can't afford to live there, but it's, it's life. These instruments, they're, they're antique art objects as well, uh, compared to a Van Gogh painting, which I don't know, 82 million, or I don't even know what the prices are now, a Strat at 10 million is it's a pretty cheap entry into the... Uh, I've got friends uh, and clients who are, um, you know, serious amateur uh, violinists who are very accomplished scientists or businessmen, 
And uh, it's a great thing to own a Strad if, if you can afford it. First of all, you don't lose money, it goes up in value. Um, you can invite great violinists after, the, after their concerts, say, come to my house and tomorrow, we'll play quartets. They'll play with you. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But then when it comes to, to, um, to the musicians you hear here today and anywhere, it's a, it's a universal source of anxiety. And um, uh, they're all trying to find something. And usually if you're very talented when you're young, um, there are sources of instruments. The Colburn Foundation, uh, Juilliard has its own collection. I guess Banff is starting a collection. Many good music schools have some instru instruments. And it's a great experience as a young player to play different instruments, just to learn what's possible. Uh, but there inevitably comes a day when you graduate. Um, if you just want an international competition, maybe someone will still lend you something. Um, but maybe they won't. And if you only came in second, they may not lend it to you. And uh, about half the people who come to me asking for instruments say, well, I have to give back my guad, you know, in three months, you know, do you have anything? I say, you should have thought of that four years ago. Um, uh, and it's, I wish I could help them. I, I really, uh, they're, they're desperate. You know, it's just like all of a sudden their, their voice is, is taken away. So uh, this struggle, is it worth it to musicians? Is it something that they, is there really a value? Is it worth striving for? to have the use of an old instrument, to buy it if possible, to borrow it if you can. Uh, so a little bit depends on what, what is the real value of these instruments, what does it really give you. One thing it does give you is it sounds good on a resume. And I know of cases, in fact, where people have a program bio that says and plays on the so-and-so Strad, and I've heard my own violins played in concert with those bios. And I've noticed that when people buy a new violin for me and they give back their Strat, it takes a while for their bios to change. <laughs> Same thing with their, their, their picture. It goes back a few years. <laughs> uh, so it's a real question. I mean, what, uh, so, uh, well, let's look at what it, what it means. Um, these people here um, are all major artists who want the thing that they have in common is they had use of a Strad or Guarneri and they had to give them back in varying circumstances, sometimes with plenty of notice, um, sometimes under very traumatic circumstances. Um, Delana Jensen is, uh, was kind of a, a very sad and very notorious case. She was a, I don't remember the exact details, she was a, a silver winner in Tchaikovsky at the time, I think she was the youngest American or the youngest woman, uh, major victory. Um, and she had been lent to Guarneri by a benefactor uh, she made a fabulous recording of the Sibelius with Ormandy and looked on the way to a, just a major career. Um, she married a conductor and the, uh, the benefactor decided, you must not be serious about your career if you're getting married. Uh, give me my violin back. And uh, she had to give it back and she was absolutely crushed. And uh, she borrowed different things and she just felt her confidence was very much shaken and she also felt really like she couldn't find something that let her do what she wanted to do, and she began to feel like the reviews were beginning to reflect that, that um, they weren't commenting on her sound in the same way, and uh, she withdrew from the stage for many years. And uh, she's playing again. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's someone where it's, it's had an ex extreme negative effect. Um, Lila Josefovich, uh, the other thing these people have in common, by the way, is they're all playing on my violins right now. Uh, <laughs> um, Lila Josefovich, who's also a major soloist now, um, she had a violin on, on loan, um, a Guarneri, a very fine instrument, and it was sold as part of a package to the New Jersey Symphony under, it's a whole another very colorful story. She was asked to give it back under fairly short notice. She borrowed another instrument that may have been a Guarneri. I never liked it much, but it, she liked it. She played that for a while, and then that gentleman passed away, and uh, the foundation that was managing his estate uh, said, you can buy it or you have to give it back. And I think she made the decision at that time that she just was not going to stay involved in basically a rat race, you could call it. Either she could pony up a, a high price for an instrument of doubtful pedigree, um, or just, um, just cut that cord and get something made really for her, for her style of playing. And she had a very specific style of playing. She's an extremely strong player. She needs something that's solid in every register with no hot spots that'll take her unawares. So in this case, she could ask for what she wanted. And uh, she tried different instruments and said, no, this one, it's got a really nice quality, but it's just, a, you know, when you're high up on the G string, it's hard to control. It's got kind of a mind of its own. I need something that you know it's gonna be there. We went through a long discovery process and when we were done, she had something that was made for her, not something that was just handed to her that she was lucky to have. 
all the rest of these people also, um, you know, had had strads, uh, or Guarneri in one case, and uh, they've had to move on. So the question is, did they sacrifice something or not? I have to keep track of the time here. Okay, let's move on. So it leads to question. So one thing, it's clearly not very practical and stressful to have or want an old instrument, but it's still a question. Okay, well, if you could have one, would you really want one? What do they give you? So. There is that question. People ask you, like they say, the, the, the 280, 2,800,000 hits on Stradivarius Secret. What is Stradivarius Secret? What makes a Strad a Strad? So do Strads have a characteristic sound that you can recognize? Can people hear it in an audience? Can players tell it? Does it do something extra for them? Well, a few years back, uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, a physicist named Claudia Fritz, and her colleague, uh, Joseph Curtin, and some other colleagues did some blind tests. There's a long history of these kind of tests, but they tried to do this one under very controlled circumstances. The first of these was done in um, Indiana at the, at the competition there. And they took uh, three strads that were from the jury, um, actually two strads in the Del Jesu, and three top-notch modern violins. They had a variety of players, including jury members, laureates, and some uh, other skilled people, put on welder's goggles. So you, could, you didn't trip over yourself, but you couldn't really tell what you were holding very well. And they put a drop of cologne on each chin rest, so you couldn't smell which was the one that was caked with old <laughs> face powder. And they just played them in a, um, in a very ordered sequence over and over again. And they were asked, uh, you know, which one sounds the fullest, which one sounds the loudest, uh, which, which one do you think is an old violin or a new violin, and which one would you take home at the end of the day? And, uh, in this very small sample, the violin that was preferred the most was a new violin, and the violin that was preferred the least was a Strad. Um, now, it stands to reason if there's 600 remaining Strads in various conditions that one of them might not be the greatest violin in the world. And it stands to reason if you have a world full of my makers working really hard, one of them might be pretty good. So, but for some reason, this hit a nerve worldwide. I mean, if you Google this, th there are little newspaper features everywhere. There were hundreds of articles about this. And I was thinking, all right, well, it's a little study. It was six violins. And it's not making earth-shaking claims. But why is it that, uh, that it struck such a, a, a nerve? Like, say it ain't so. What, how can that be? Uh, because it's such a closely held belief that people, there is something about them. Um, they repeated this study in Paris recently. Um, they haven't published yet, but the results were very similar, and this was a much wider sampling. They also did pieces with orchestra. Same results. Um, that the results were basically almost like you'd um, just flipped a coin. Um, people preferred different violins for different reasons, and um, almost nobody could tell what was old and what was new, and new violins were, were preferred actually more in these cases than strads. Doesn't mean there's still not something special about them, but it's not something that shows up in sort of the rough and tumble of these kind of performance situations. So it's, a, it's one of those things that you feel, even me, I mean, I've been making new instruments, I know that people like them, but I didn't want to believe either. I still, you know, we like to say, that, well, okay, listeners can't tell, but players can feel it. But in this case, players didn't even necessarily prefer it. So what are we dealing with? What is a Strad? Um, it's something. So, what actually makes any violin great? And really, a better question to ask, I'm always, uh, I always find the question of what makes a Strad so great to be a question that sounds like a question but doesn't actually have any content. It, it's, it's a, um, it presumes that they are a certain way that could be recognized. If they're not all the same and they can't be recognized in one consistent way, then you can't describe them with a blanket uh, description. So, then the real question is what makes the violin such an amazing instrument? You know, why does this box of wood work so well? So really the more practical question right now is what do musicians need out of an instrument and how can we give it to them? So let's look at some strads. This is a strad, 1710. This is a, was in Morel's shop. This is the same violin with the top off from the inside. All those little splotches and beauty marks, those are all uh, little reinforcements that have been put on the violin to reinforce cracks. Um, that pale area in the center is an, a big patch over the whole central area. Um, that's a huge amount of stiffening that's been done to that violin. And for sure, that violin is not exactly the same violin that it was when it was new. And interestingly, it's not necessarily any worse either. 
Uh, this is a, before I stopped doing restoration, this was one of my last big restorations on an Andre Guarneri, and uh, I wouldn't even want to do this work anymore. It's so time consuming, and it's also kind of sad to, on the lower left there, or whatever side that is, uh, I'm carving away a, a brutalized edge and I'm going to replace it with new wood, which is practical for someone traveling around the world with this thing in this case, but it's a sad thing to do to uh, an instrument that will never be made again. Um, but just to say that you can see how, how much these instruments have, uh, have changed over time. So, then it comes to, you know, so we've looked at all these violins, we've looked at strads, we've seen the, the changes that have happened to old instruments. So really, in a way, the more practical question is, okay, what is it, what do you need out of an instrument, how do you do it? And in order to do that, we have to know uh, more about how the violin works. So, uh, in a way, to me, um, a Strad, the best Strads, not the run of them, but um, you know, Joshua Bell's Strad is really one of the great ones, or Cho Lang Lin's Strad that I get to, to you know, have some time studying. Those are, um, those are examples for the present. I think that, in the most part, you know, they should just be written off as musicians' tools now. It's just, for the most part, not practical. Um, however, they should be preserved as, and made accessible as examples so that we can continue those traditions. And I think that's the point of all this is, uh, you know, it's, if, the, if the mystique, you know, if you believe it's a secret or a mystery, what can you do about a, a mystery? But if it's uh, um, a friend, one of my clients who owns a Strad and a Gornary is also an avid golfer and he had a book uh, about golf, a very technical book, and in the beginning, it, uh, the preface, it said, you may think all my descriptions sound complicated, but wouldn't you rather it was complicated than mysterious? <laughs> so, com complicated we could conceivably do. So, how do we learn from the past, and how do we do something like these instruments? And basically, um, just like classical music is a very retrospective art, where people study the works of the past and recreate them, in addition to trying to add their own interpretations, and in addition to composing new works, they really start with the study of the past, and we do the same. Because the, uh, you know, instead of doing all new R&D each time, the easiest way to make something good is to find something really, really good and do exactly what they did. It's a very effective strategy. So I've done plenty of that. I, I made my career as a copyist. And uh, here on the, uh, there's, in the middle, it's actually a Guarneri that I like particularly, but there's, on the one side, there's measurements that I've taken, um, you know, to the detail, tenths of a millimeter, size, shape, thicknesses. Um, and then also observing details of craftsmanship. And, you know, in this violin I had a part, and you could see just how it's made inside, exact thicknesses. So we can get, uh, we begin to get very close to, um, to how things were done. And uh, one of the things that's different now, uh, you know, before I was speaking about national schools and how the makers of Germany in the 18th century were completely different in style than the makers of Italy in that same period. So this instrument sounded really different. Nowadays, just like everything else, it's become very international. Information has become much more accessible. You can buy really beautiful books of photographs and measurements and uh, the kind of data that you never could have gotten before. And people study in different countries, they travel. So violin making internationally has, in one way, become much more uniform. In another way, much better for our current tastes. Um, now, one of the things uh, you know, we tend to think of the violin as an object, an object, an unchanging object. And as I was trying to show before, they're, they're really not unchanging because they can be changed. Um, they change all the time without even touching them every time the weather changes. They shrink and they expand. Um, so there's always a dynamic process going on with them. And in use, when a violinist picks up a violin, that's to me when it becomes really a violin. Before, it's just a just a box. It actually be, takes on its violinness under the bow. Um, and you can't even study it effectively except in that circumstance or understand it. So for me, I've, uh, 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 I call it the invisible violin, which is the violin you can't see just holding it, uh, which is all the vibration, it's all the interaction with the player. Um, it's all the things that actually make sound that are real phenomena, but they're just not very easy to see. Um, but one of the ways to sort of uh, get involved with that process is to actually see things in change before and after. You have something, let's say, nothing is so good that you couldn't improve it in some way. Um, 
uh, nothing is so bad that it couldn't be worse. And uh, <laughs> anything you do will change something. So even starting from a completely black box, all you have to start doing is changing something and watching what happens, what's the effect. If you like it, do more of that. That's sort of the basic uh, blind man's approach to progress. In this case, uh, up here, this was a violin that I made fairly early in my career um, for Isaac Stern. And at the time, that was uh, such an intimidating thrill for me. I mean, when I grew up, if you weren't very good playing the violin, they would say, he's no Isaac Stern. So uh, to actually meet him, it was like meeting the Pope. Um, and then uh, this was under the, the mentorship of my teacher, Rene Morel. Uh, and I made the violin, and I gave it to him. He liked it. He played it a little bit. And then, you know, I talked to him some time later. He says, yeah, it's great. And, it's not really as deep as my guarnieri. I'm like, what do you want from me? <laughs> um, but okay, so someone who is presumably really knowledgeable, really experienced, and really important and influential has just told me that something is not as good as it could be. What are you going to do? You can just say, well, play it for 200 years? Um, or, well, it's not a guarnieri. What do you want from me? Or, no, you, you want, you're very motivated to say, okay, well, what do you want? And uh, so he said, I want more depth, a little more flexibility when you push in so you can pull closer. So I said, no problem. Took it home, took it apart. Uh, I thinned out certain parts um, that I'd been a little conservative with, put it back together. In this case, luckily, he liked it better. Uh, therefore, I consider it a successful experiment. And also the model for how I worked going forward, which is building a violin is just a little piece of, of it. The whole thing is, um, is, is getting into the hands of a musician and then seeing how does it work? What do they want? And listening to them. Because nobody knows more about sound than musicians. No one is, you know, uh, violin makers can be a little dismissive or in, uh, of musicians because uh, they sometimes seem so, so sensitive. And uh, uh, violin makers, sometimes they joke about, oh, this guy is so neurotic, you know, he came in. And, uh, um, I told him to come back the next day, I didn't do anything, he was happier. Um, uh, 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 there's lots of stories like that, and I have to say, I'm, I find them, um, uh, honestly, uh, there's an element of truth in it, but they're also, people are just missing such a valuable source. I mean, I, and it's also a little disrespectful. Who knows more about the violin sound than violinists? They're trained to be hyper, hypersensitive. They do things which I can't even imagine how they do it. So part of the art of violin making is just to learn to really listen to violinists, not just their violins, but to them and to watch them and to understand. You can sometimes see someone's playing and they'll be they'll just playing along and sort of they, they do something and then they'll do it again. You can say, oh, that must have been a little, a little uh, awkward right in that spot. They just they stumbled over that note. They didn't like it. Um, and, then, and they're usually very polite, so they don't want to say, this is, this is no good. So uh, you watch them and you try to encourage them to be as expressive as possible with words. And, and then... Uh, uh, you know, with that, like I say, it's, it, you don't need to be a genius. You just need to work with geniuses. Um, so, uh, and this is, you know, in, in that vein, you know, so this is something that violin shops do routinely, is take instruments, strads, for example, that don't sound very good, and uh, make them sound like strads. I mean, something that expensive, people just don't stop working on it until it's actually delivering what they expect. Um, and they'll put a lot of time, bass bars and patches and neck resets and restoring arches and amazing amounts of highly invasive surgery um, until the instruments start working again. So um, there's this huge arena in which you can influence the physical structure of the instrument to change the sound. Uh, the question is, what should you do and where should you do it and what will the effect be? And uh, one of the problems with, um, with traditional and empirical uh, arts is that uh, there's a huge body of empirical knowledge of what people have done that worked. But there's often very little insight into how things really work. So it's very hard to make, make uh, postulations about what would be a useful experiment. Um, and personally, I always found that very frustrating. Um, this is a, a, a experimental fiddle of mine um, that I was very excited by. I called it gluey. It was a cheap violin, which I fixed up a little bit and uh, it's overly thin. It, it's, I deliberately made it ugly because uh, as a professional, usually if you have a violin and you get it to a pl place where it's sounding pretty good and somebody wants to buy it, it's sort of like, okay, I could be done right now. 
Um, and you, that's, so I, for an experimental purposes, I wanted to have something that I couldn't possibly sell, <laughs> that I wouldn't even be tempted to. And that also was a, um, part of the, the difficulty with experimenting with the violin is that they're so expensive, not even old ones, new ones. It's a huge amount of work you put into it. Uh, it's, uh, you don't want to mess it up just before you sell it. So uh, I needed, for, so in order to get more knowledge, you know, there's have to find different ways to research the instrument, and I needed a tool for R and D, which was fast and cheap. And that's what the purpose of this was. You could put little stiffeners on the violin anywhere you wanted with a hot melt adhesive. Um, you play it, say, well, what would happen if you stiffened it right over there? Put the piece on. Tss, Ten seconds later, you could play it again. You can say, oh, that's good. Let's do another one there. Tss, not so good. Off it comes. You could reconfigure this violin in. Um, every 10 minutes in major ways. And what was also very alarming was that this really poor quality violin, basically, could be made to sound alarmingly good, much better than many old violins, maybe even better than some of mine. And, and there's no rare wood, there's no secret varnish, there's no hundreds of years. Uh, there's just structure and vibration and sounds. It's, it's a kind of uh, unromantic, materialistic view of it, but you know, uh, like doctors, when you go to the doctor, you don't want a really romantic doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so, to me, this is, this is the, um, the, the laboratory and, and the process by which instruments can be made to work better and you can learn about them, which is this interaction between the instrument and the player and the maker. You play it. You come up with, a thing, uh, you come up with something that you want more of. Can't you make it project a little better on the G-string? Okay, I think if I stiffen it in this little area here, it might do that. I do it. We play it again. That was better. That part of the experiment was a little yes. You do that again and again and again and again. You have a mechanism for, for really improving things. And also for doing it in a way that involves musicians. Instead of them being just like the, the you know, the, on the receiving end of largesse, uh, they really can be an active participant in what they're doing. I mean, this experimental violin, Gluey, is not what my usual day and day work is. However, that model of working is something I do even in routine adjustments, little sound post adjustments. Um, if someone's unhappy with something, I don't hesitate to take it apart and rebuild it. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, my dad had a laundry and uh, you know, they used to say, the customer is always right. And in the case of a violin, they're the person who has to play it. So that's what I've really built uh, my practice around it, is, um, what does the musician need? What are they trying to do? They have a hard job, and I want, you know, a maker or anyone with new old or old instruments has to support them in that mission. So another question about all this is that, is there anywhere to go beyond just experimentation? Um, you know, for Strad, he could just make 2,000 instruments, one after another. He was born into a great tradition, and he took it even a little higher. And he didn't have to sweat about it each time, but uh, we don't really have that luxury. So, and, and also we're, you know, people, we have to work on the best level, otherwise there's no career. You can't compete with commercial work, so. And also if you're curious about the instrument, like how does it work? How does, what's happening in there? So um, I started getting involved with uh, scientists, uh, and this was a collaborative uh, research project that I actually came into as just the Strad Wrangler. I'm not a physicist or a scientist, uh, but I was, I'm part of a program that brings scientists together with violin makers, and there was a physicist named George Bissinger, uh, who has one of the best research labs for violins. And one of the ways to test vi violin vibration is with lasers, where you give a little signal to the violin and then you can, the lasers can uh, touch the surface harmlessly, and the beam will, will vi vibrate with the vibration of the surface, and then you can create animations of how the violin is really working. It's a little bit the way that Pixar makes uh, you know, motion capture animation, same principle. So uh, there was a 3D laser that was offered to Dr. Bissinger by the company that makes them. It was a $700,000 piece of equipment. And they said, we'll bring it to you. We need a Strad to scan, of course. So, uh, so they can tell their board of directors we're gonna scan a Strad. So I helped him find two Strads and a Del Jesu. And we brought them to his lab. Uh, and well, I'll just describe the process a little bit. This is Dr. Bissinger. Uh, there's a setup for, for holding the violins for scanning. Those are the three violins we worked with. It was the Wilmot Stradivari, 
1704, the Titian from 1715, and the Plowden Guarneri from 1735. Uh, you know, so, so Bissinger was a scientist on this. I'm not trying to, to, I wouldn't pretend to that. One of the things, though, after that was done, I realized scientists work in their realm, and they're interested in publishing papers. They want a certain kind of information. It doesn't happen to be the same things that we want to know. He's not actually, Bissinger was not that interested in saying, this is how you make your violin sound better. He was interested in basic physics principles that he could publish. But I thought we have a, a wealth of data and images here that have never been seen before in this way. And then we have our own data that we've been collecting, photographs, measurements, recordings, just to, you know, and usually these worlds of knowledge don't meet. So I thought, well, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a violinist, but I'm here in the middle of these worlds and I could uh, somehow try to bring people together to put all the knowledge in one place. So I invited a lot of, I think, my, my most gifted colleagues to, to do different aspects of it. CT scanning, um, uh, Renaissance style geometric design. Uh, we did recordings in a, uh, the recording engineer for the Emerson String Quartet recorded all the instruments played by a great violinist. One of the things we did was we CT, CT scanned all the instruments. This is the same CT scanner that hopefully you won't ever have to go through. Um, but it turns out that radiologists are pretty underemployed. So uh, <laughs> if you catch them at the right time, you can, you can uh, get your violence through there. Right now, this is the, the Beth Stradivari, uh, which is in the Library of Congress right now. And you see a lot of things in the CT scans. What we're seeing right now is little cross sections. There's actually, I think, a thousand of them as the violin goes through the scanner. So we've, it's an animated movie because we're seeing them frame by frame. So we're actually like traveling through the instrument like this. And you can see the density of the wood. You can see the shapes, the bass bar. You can see little repairs as they go by. And one of the things that struck me about these is uh, it's a great research tool, but it's quite mesmerizing and quite beautiful, really. And it was, uh, I found it very satisfying that an object that, that produces such beautiful sounds uh, even looked at it in a completely unfamiliar way. There was a very harmonious flow to the lines. And I mean, there's a, very much a Renaissance uh, conception that infuses the violin, which is uh, beautiful form leads to beautiful function. And as an engineering principle, it's pretty good. Uh, this was uh, the modal analysis that we did. Uh, the instrument was scanned on 600 points on this thing um, with these three lasers. And then in the lower corner, I don't know how well you can see any of this, but they create basically a little framework a model, a crude model of a violin, and then they can animate it at different frequencies. I'm going to show you a little of these images. Um, these are animations of the actual vibration move movements of an actual Strad. They're highly magnified. Um, and they're very much slowed down. And the images are a bit crude, but they're also things that uh, I had never seen before. So each of those little points was a point at which it was scanned. And uh, the numbers down at the bottom is the number of hertz per second that it's vibrating at when it makes that motion. So for example, 471, it's like a, a, a A-sharp or something. Uh, and at low frequencies, you know, the violin moves in kind of organized ways. Uh, if we had more time, it, it, I find this endlessly fascinating. I mean, there's questions like, what does the sound post do? You know, what does the bass bar do? And uh, you can see what they do. Um, I'm sorry we don't have more time to explore those. Um, and the thing is that these things, they look almost surreal. And they're filmed a little dramatically. But all this is absolutely real. It's really happening. Um, and you can actually, when someone's playing a violin, and if we have a minute, we might do it, you can actually feel around the surface with your fingertips and feel which parts of the violin are vibrating. It's very tangible. And uh, you know, ultimately, the violin is, is, is just a conduit for energy. Um, you know, there's an impulse that starts in the mind of a musician, and they send those to their muscles and to their hands. And there's a little point of contact between the bow and the string, which is like that big. And that's where the energy is transferred from the violinist to his hands, to his bow, to the string. And the string to the bridge, and the bridge to the body. And that little tiny pathway is what's, you know, basically when that impulse hits the violin, the violinist moves a little bit and then tries to release that energy. And that's why it vibrates. 
and the surface of the violin moves, and that moves air. That air moves the air next to it all the way to where you're sitting in the back of the room, and that moves your eardrum and then to your nerves and to your brain. So in a sense, there's a direct line from the musician's brain to your brain. It's very physical. It's not, it's not uh, metaphysical, and it's something that can be tracked. And uh, I think that uh, rather than thinking of violins as this you know, rare, valuable artifact, I find it a more beautiful way to look at it as a, a, a vibrant and dynamic object, which is just part of that chain of transmitting you know, an intent from a musician to a listener. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we have, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. And Jennifer, would you, uh, are you going to be able to... Uh, well, you could take this one. Who has a question? Sam. Got one right here. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, you've been describing what sounds like very physical attributes of a violin. Um, when I, back in the day when I was studying violin on, and playing basically a piece of firewood, um, sometimes at a lesson my teacher would play the violin for a few minutes and when she gave it back to me, it would be easier to play, it would sound better. And I'm wondering to what extent do the people who have been playing the strads for all these years have some sort of an effect or did I just imagine it? There's, uh, no, there's no definitive answer to that question, unfortunately, because it's some of each. I mean, I find that uh, when instruments of mine have been out in the world for a while, when they come back, they sound better. Now, a lot of things have been happening in that time. Um, but even, you know, a little thing that I sometimes do with a, a brand new violin, I don't recommend you try this, is just put my fingers right on the bridge and actually just move it a little bit physically. I mean, since this is something which is going to move, it's like a brand new shoe. You know, it's, uh, it can be kind of stiff and then it, it gets more flexible the more it's used. And sometimes just physically playing it a little harder, I mean, that was advice that I got to, for breaking instruments, is just play double stops as loud as you can. Um, unfortunately, these are human phenomena, so that's very difficult to measure or quantify. Um, and uh, so I think probably something changed, but just hearing your teacher play that way, close up to the instrument, and you know, the human brain is very complex. So I'd say, I can't tell you whether or not it's a physical phenomena, but it's a real phenomena. <laughs> along, along those same lines, I had a uh, former student who eventually got lots of money and had a, was able to borrow a Strad. And he's, other people used it, and from time to time, he would give it to some person and several people that he didn't really know but he eventually, when he'd get back, he knew which person had it before him. <laughs> As I say, uh, you know they say that when you talk to your plants, they grow better? Uh, but, it, but it's not necessarily because your plants understand English. Um, I mean, when you, when you talk to a plant, you're leaning nearby it. Some people think you're breathing more carbon dioxide on it. You're noticing there's a brown leaf and you pluck it off and you water it. And, there's a hundred little ways that people interact with instruments. Um, and vibrating with the bow is one way. Um, so the kind of one, of the, one of the hard things about researching the violin is that the type of changes that the human ear can hear are so small that so far m almost any scientific tests are cruder than what the human ear can do so far. So uh, there are many things that are not yet easily studied. Uh, so it's hard to put a finger on it, but uh, um, I've hung around scientists enough that I'm skeptical, but also I've been around violinists enough to see that these things are real, so. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, yeah, I agree also that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a few years ago, I was at a concert, at, uh, I think it was a cello concerto, and the, uh, the soloist was using a, a carbon fiber cello. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, do you have any comments on, on materials beyond maple and spruce and wood and, mm. well, for example, carbon fiber or 
or other things? Well, with bow makers, it's already happened. Uh, bow, bows depend very heavily on their wood. It's a stick, you know, it's a beautiful, pure object, and it's highly dependent on the source of wood, which now grows in an endangered rainforest and may no longer be legally exported. Um, so with bows, to make top quality bows, there still are makers who've got great wood, but um, there's just not much left. So there has been very little choice. So there are now very fine carbon fiber bows being made. Um, you know, I think that uh, technically speaking, there's not a limitation. It's just a, a, it's going to be a matter of, uh, of time. Oh, well, why not? I mean, actually, you know, uh, wood has several main characteristics. It it's weighs a certain amount, it's got a certain amount of stiffness, and it's got a certain amount of what they call damping, which means how much energy is absorbed just as friction, you know, deadened. And those are the three main characteristics. If you could recreate them in a, in a composite material, you could conceivably have a much higher ratio of stiffness to weight, for example. Uh, it's not entirely clear exactly what we want. Myself, I have to say, I'm, uh, um, I find it intriguing, but material technology is not my specialty, so I'm reluctant to get into it because um, I'm just not going to be good at it. You know? um, but in the future, I'm sure that good instruments can, can be, apparently already were, made out of carbon fiber. In, in the um, example you showed with the 3D laser, how did you transmit the vibration to the violin? Was it bowed, or did you use a tuning fork, or something else? Right, it was done two different ways for two different sets of tests. Um, and the, in the ones you just saw, um, we used a speaker that went through a sweep. Um, for the more calibrated tests, we used a tiny little tapper uh, that taps the bridge with a, a calibrated force. Um, the, 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 for research, not the kind of research I do, but for Dr. Bissinger, he needs exactly repeatable impulses. Uh, you couldn't... Um, one thing to say is that when a person puts the violin on their shoulder and then holds it, it, it changes the vibrations quite a lot. I want to uh, thank you for bringing Einstein to the violin <laughs> and showing that material and energy uh, are transmittable and transformable and uh, can be bent by gravity as well as by levity. <laughs> In the latter respect, I want to thank you for reminding me uh, when, you showed the, uh, when you showed the Stern violin mm -hmm. of a story I hadn't heard about or thought about for decades, and that is that Muhammad Ali, the pugilist, and Isaac Stern were at a banquet. And Stern said to him, you know, you and I are in the same business. We both use our hands. And Ali looked at him and said, you must be pretty good. There's not a mark on you. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I wonder if I'm not alone in hoping that we have time to hear your violin. Well, absolutely, Barry. You have several violins, Sam. Um, you've got two. The, the band fiddle is on here. Do you want another shoulder rest? Or? Yeah, this is the... That's the band. This is the band one. Uh, so which one is this, Barry? This is uh, one of Sam's violins made in 2011 that the Banff Center commissioned. Um, and interestingly, you no, know, there was this uh, question of whether they sound better after being played. Um, this violin was loaned out to a young violinist, and um, she wasn't happy with how it sounded. She was very happy when she first got it, and then it didn't sound very good. So we gave it to Sam, and I don't know what you did, um, but it sounds better. So, well, the hotel staff probably didn't appreciate having to <laughs> vacuum up the wood shavings. <laughs> you should turn the mics off. I should say Sam's uh, 
one of the violins that Sam made, um, the, f the one that I first heard, was loaned to me by um, David Finkel, the cellist of the Emerson Quartet, when I was studying with them in New York. And uh, I won the Banff competition on your fiddle. So. <laughs> but I always wrote in my bio that I played a Strad. Not so much that I, I, more because I thought it was hysterically funny to do that and to watch people come backstage, because these violins, um, Sam's a copyist, as he mentioned, so if you don't know, it looks like a Strad. I mean, I can't tell. And people would come back, and, what a fantastic sound. Where's that Strad? And just watch them, you know. And, uh, it was really great. The one or two times you see it printed in the paper in a review. Now, um, actually, Sam is way more famous. So there's, there is a cachet around having a Zygmunt Tovich, which is you know, interesting. Two thousand two. Made for Maxime Vengeroff. Nice. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have time for one more question or two. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you use European or Bosnian maple. Mm -hmm and spruce, and uh, I've heard discussions about whether that's better wood. I mean, we have American maple and Sitka spruce, Engelman spruce, there's instruments out of China. Now, is this because of what you're used to working with? Is it more of the mythology because the instrument comes out of Europe? Um, do you have any comments on that? Yes, uh, it's a good question. Um, well, one of the things is, is that, uh, you know, natural materials that grow have, uh, you know, first of all, there's different species of maples and, and spruces. Uh, even among similar species, it can be different depending on the altitude of this, there that's grown, special differing soil conditions. Uh, so it's just like, uh, you know, they say cheese has a terroir or, or wine. It has a, a link to its soil. So uh, it's often hard to tell how much of that is, is uh, romance and how much it's real. Uh, there are really great woods that grow, especially in the western part of, of uh, the U.S. and Canada. Uh, Engelmann spruce seems to be the closest uh, analog to European spruce. I have used it. It's good. Um, some of the big leaf maple that grows here, um, it's quite different than the European maples, but it makes, it's great for violas and cellos because it's a bit lighter weight. So um, there's a lot of alternatives. The thing is, unlike a bow, which has, is, is a very simple mechanism, Violin is a quite complicated mechanism, and there's many points at which you can affect it. The arching, the uh, shape, height, the thicknesses, the bracing. So you often can, um, if you're paying attention, you can compensate for attributes of the wood by different, different uh, construction techniques. To make life simple and to eliminate variables, I've just chosen, for the most part, to use uh, uh, materials that have been used for a long time in that way, um, because it. Uh, if you're going to track your work, it, it's, you know, there are so many variables. So for me personally, it's been uh, mentally easier just to, to stick with, uh, you know, the wood that has been demonstrated already to be the best because there's enough other things to experiment with. But when that runs out, there's plenty of other good stuff. Sam, we do have to wrap okay. it up, but I hope you don't mind people accosting you over the next day or two. No, uh, please, you're welcome. As long as you're here. Thank you so much. Because then they can get a chance to ask questions because this is an incredibly interesting and... Uh, uh, fascinating subject which uh, will in a way never get resolved but uh, thank you so much for coming thank by. you Wonderful. Thank, you so much. thank you ladies and gentlemen we'll see you up the hill in half an hour <laughs> <laughs>